chapter 20, verse 18. Uh, and I titled this message, uh, God's Agenda is Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Mm -hmm. And we've been in the worship today. Uh, just, uh, yeah, we're going to get into the text. Verse 18. It says, And the people of Israel arose and went up to Bethel, inquired <coughs> of God, uh, Who shall go up first for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Uh, then the people of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to fight against Benjamin, and the men of Israel drew up the battle line against them at Gibeah. The people of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and destroyed on that day 22,000 men of the Israelites. But the people of the men of Israel took courage and again formed the battle line in the same place where they had formed it on the first day. And the people of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until the evening, and they inquired of the Lord, Shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. So the people of Israel came near against the people of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed 18,000 men of the people of Israel. All these were men who drew the sword. Then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days, saying, Shall we go once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin, or shall we cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. This story that we are looking at, it demonstrates the faithfulness of God um, to bring unfaithful Israel back to true worship by the use of the, de the defeat from their enemies. And God is faithful to use, e uh, to use us. Sorry, God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to Him. But His faithfulness doesn't come without purpose. He desires faith and faithfulness apart. God's agenda is faithfulness. Will you pray with me? Lord God, Father, thank you tonight, Lord, for the worship, God for your presence that was yes, here with us, Lord. Yes. We thank you in this place tonight, God, and we thank you for your word. God, I ask for your help, Lord, to minister this word to you, to my brothers here, God, and I ask that you give them ears to hear, a heart to receive, Lord. I believe you have given us this word tonight, Lord, for you're trying to speak something to us, Lord. That you are faithful, God, and you desire faithfulness from us, Lord. And Father, we just give you praise tonight, we give you worship, and give you the thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, my keypad popped up on this thing. I don't know how to get rid of it. Alright, so the book of Judges. Uh, the purpose of the book, uh, there's two major themes that run through the book of Judges. One, the depravity of Israel and their covenant disobedience. Um, and the other one is God's faithfulness to the covenant, even though Israel is unfaithful. And we see in the book seven of these cycles that go on. Israel is walking in covenant obedience, and then they start to disobey, and they go sink into depravity and defeat from their enemies, and then they come, God will send a deliverer and raise them up, and they'll be in obedience and prosper. And the cycle continues seven times through the book, through the main narrative of the book. The first chapters of the book illustrate Israel's deterioration from the covenant. In the book of Joshua, we see Israel triumphing over their enemies in conquest uh, by the power of God and by obedience to the covenant. Uh, he gives them the land and drives out their enemies. Well, in the opening chapters of Judges, we see that after Joshua dies, they continue in the conquest, but they begin to disobey the Lord. The Lord had told them to go into the land and to drive out the inhabitants of the land and to drive out, to uh, destroy their idols and their foreign gods. But Israel 
start to not do that. They start to take the land and they allow the enemy, the people, the inhabitants of the land to stay. And they just put them to forced labor, which was in direct disobedience to the covenant. And so God judges them. He says, um, you have not driven out the people like I told you. Now the inhabitants, they're going to become um, a snare to you. And the foreign gods will become a thorn in your side. And this is the setting or, uh, in, for the rest of the book of Judges. Uh, the last five chapters of the book, where we get our text from, the narrator uses them to describe uh, the depravity of Israel in this time. Uh, their personal and tribal immorality and personal and tribal idolatry and just the, the wickedness and the depravity of um, covenant disobedience. Um, these stories are not necessarily in chronological order. They, they didn't really happen at the end of the Judges period. Um, the, it's a, how the narrator uses the themes. Most likely our story that we're dealing with, it uh, happened not too long after the death of Joshua because it mentions Phineas, uh, son of Eleazar, son of uh, Aaron the priest. And so the cause of this battle that we're going to be looking at is has to do with, if you remember, the Levite and his concubine. He, the Levite, um, he had this concubine, and she goes out um, and is unfaithful to him and runs from him, and he has to go find her at her dad's, and they end up camping at Gibeah, and this old man takes them in, and the Bible says these wicked or perverted men of Benjamin surround the house and demand that he sends out the Levite and his concubine. Well, they end up taking just the concubine, and they abuse her all night until she dies. And it's definitely, it was for the longest time the worst story that I've ever read in the Bible. I was like, why is this in here, Lord? Like, I could have just tore the page out of the Bible. It's like that. It was hard to read. I didn't understand it. Um, but there is good reason for it in here now that I understand the themes and what that narrator was using with the story to illustrate to us the depravity of you know, um, disobedience to the Lord, of, of leaving the covenant. You know? yeah. And um, so, why does God allow Israel to suffer defeat from these wicked Benjamites? I, that was my question when I when I first read the story. It's like, why why the defeat? I didn't well, I didn't understand it at first, um, but I realized after studying, God is more concerned about faithfulness to the covenant than He is our judgments of what is right and our understanding of righteousness. But God is just in everything that He does, and. So we, just, we got to remember the story that God, God's agenda is faithfulness. Faithfulness is his agenda. And so, let's see, did I do enough background? Okay, so the Levite, when he finds his concubine dead, he, he cuts her up into 12 pieces, and he sends her out to the 12 tribes of Israel. And they all gather together. Wow. Yeah, they gather together to. Um, the Levi brings them together to ask, you know, if he wants revenge, he wants justice for this. And this is this leads us into the the story that we're going to be looking at. Um, so, looking at the first uh, paragraph here, 18 through 21. I'm just going to read it again real quick. The people of Israel rose and went up to Bethel and inquired of God. Who shall go up first for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Then the people of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gideon. And the men of Israel went out to fight against Benjamin. And the men of Israel drew up the battle line against them at Gideon. The people of Benjamin came out of Gideon and destroyed on that day 22,000 men of the Israelites. So my first point is their problem, the problem, is self-dependence, self-sufficiency. So they gathered together, the Bible says that it's one man, and they decided to go to all out war against Benjamin. They didn't even seek the Lord if they should go to war. They just decided, uh, 
in, in a group all together as one that we're going to go and we're going to repay them for this wickedness. It was a, uh, their own judgment, their own um, assessment of what is right. And they didn't even ask the Lord. And so their main problem is self-dependence. The, this portion of the scripture is bookend, bookended by this verse that says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This was the condition and how they um, um, are described as by the narrator. So they gather together as one. They didn't ask the Lord for direction. And then they go up to Be uh, the house of Bethel, which is, in some translations is called the house of the Lord. And we see that they fail to inquire God properly. They go up and they ask the Lord, who should go first to the battle? Well, it's believed that Bethel was most likely full of idol worship, full of idolatry, and they weren't they didn't inquire God properly with the offerings and with the priests. So it was a failed attempt of worship. And then we see that the Lord, he actually responds to them. He says, okay, send Judah. And then, you know, the, the Israelites at this time, hearing from the Lord to send Judah, they probably took this as God's assurance of victory, even though he never gives that promise of victory. Um, and... Genesis 49, 8, Jacob prophesies over his sons, and when he prophesies over Judah, he says, Judah, Judah's foot will be upon the neck of his enemies, and his brothers will be, um, will give their obedience unto him. So Judah is depicted as this vict victor, this victorious conquering lion. So they might, may be thinking that this word is assurance of victory. And as well in Judges chapter 1, verse 1, Israel asks the same question to the Lord. He says, who should go up first against the Canaanites? And he says, Judah first. Uh, but that time, he, uh, the Lord promises that he will give the land into their hands. So he gives a promise because they are walking in faithfulness. In this instance, they're not walking in faithfulness. So the problem is self-dependency. And this can be characteristic of any Christian. Our main problem is self, self-dependency, self-sufficiency. Right. Um, Do we? It's easy for the Christian to walk through their days depending upon their own judgments and their own assessments of things, depending on their own strengths, and to fail to inquire God properly. To to go through your day, and the uh, sure, or a way to test this or to know is: Do you go through your day? without depending upon the Lord, spending that time in prayer, you know, seeking God and asking Him for His judgments, for His um, guidance and strength in your life. You know, we don't know what we're going to face throughout the day, you know. We don't know what, what'll, what will arise. And to go with, to live uh, without depending upon the Lord, uh, neglecting prayer and seek him properly uh, is self-dependence. And as well, our seeking the Lord, our aquarium, could be, could have idolatry in it. And you know, anything that has our attention more than the Lord does, anything that we desire or that we place next to the Lord or love more than spending time with the Lord, you know, that's idolatry. Uh, do we have idols in our worship, in the place of worship? And are we failing to inquire God properly? Amen. And, you know, they had a false sense of victory. You know, they have, were taken, could have taken the prophecy of victory of Judah and thought that it was a promise of assurance of victory over their enemies, but we see that they it wasn't. And... Similarly, the Christian can understand the message of the cross, can understand the promises of the gospel and the victory that is there, but not be living in faithfulness, not have the promise of victory. Yeah. It, you know, these are uh, there are possibilities. And as an illustration, you see the most dedicated person, David, uh, well, in one's own opinion, I suppose, but 
He said, I always set the Lord before my eyes. And we see that he was a, a man of prayer. He would rise up early and he'd seek the Lord. You know, before the sun even rose up, he said, I anticipate the rising of the sun that I may get in the word and that I might hear his voice, you know, and learn from his word. And we see that he had to learn dependence upon the Lord. When uh, he was running from Saul in the wilderness, the story goes with Nabal, he was guarding Nabal's sheep. He would protect them. Well, when they came, when he wanted, he needed provisions, so he sends men to Nabal to ask for provisions. And Nabal, being a crude, sends him away and says, no, I don't know, David, I'm not giving him anything. Well, when his men bring back this word, David, he um, jumps to conclusions or jumps into judgment. He says, strap on your swords. We're going to take out Nabal. And so on their way to Nabal, Abigail hears and meets them, and she stops David. She says, don't do this. I'm paraphrasing. So don't do this, wickedness. Um, you're taking revenge in your own hands, more or less. This will affect you when you become king of Judah. And David agrees with her. He says, blessed are you. Thank you for stopping me from doing this. And we see later on that David learns this uh, dependence upon the Lord. When uh, he comes to Ziklag with his men, the Amalekites have taken his wives and his men's wives and their children. They burn the city. Uh, David doesn't just rise up right away and go after them chase him down to return it, or to take back everything. Uh, but it says that he encourages himself in the Lord. So he seeks the Lord. He comes to the Lord first, and then the Lord says uh, that, to go after them and gives him the promise that she will retrieve everything that they have taken. So we see David had learned this dependence upon the Lord. He didn't get a lot of stress and pressure in that moment. His guys wanted to stone him he could have just easily said, let's go. Let's go retrieve our stuff. But he goes to the Lord. And he asks the Lord first. So we see that he was dependent there. Um, what about us? Do, do we go through most of our days with confidence in our own judgments? Failing to ask the Lord's guidance and direction for the day? Uh, and to gain assurance of victory over every attack that might arise in our lives? We depend upon ourselves more. We travel through our days self-dependent and, and self-sufficiency. Right. Moving on to my second point from verses 22 to 25. I'm going to read them again. But the people, the men of Israel, took courage and again formed the battle line in the same place where they had formed it on the first day. And the people of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until the evening. And they inquired of the Lord, Shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. So the people of Israel came near against the people of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed 18,000 men of the people of Israel. All these were men who drew the sword. So my second point is, God uses failure and defeat to promote self-examination. We see God allowed this battle. He said, Judah, go first. The Israelites, they decided in themselves to go to battle, but they came to the Lord and asked who first, and God said Judah first. So he, he allows them to go to battle and suffer this defeat. And we see that now they're, they're weeping before the Lord. Um, so signs of repentant sorrow. And their inquiry this time of the Lord, in verse 18, it says, when they ask the Lord who shall go up first for us, they say, who shall go first to fight against the people of Benjamin? People of Benjamin. Now, their inquiry has changed. It says, shall we, in verse 23, at the end, shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, Benjamin, people of Benjamin? So there's a change there. They're weeping. They have started to self-examine themselves. What are our motives? Why has the Lord allowed us to be defeated? Were we not right in our judgments, in our decision to go to war against Benjamin? Don't they deserve 
um, payment for this wickedness? Were we not right in our decisions? Um, they are thinking, I think they're self-examining and they're thinking our brothers, um, the sin or the seriousness of going against their own members, their own, own tribes. Uh, the seriousness of intertribal war, the sin of it, you know. And there, we see them examining themselves. And so the Lord allows us to go through trials and struggles in order to bring us to self-examine ourselves, to check ourselves, to judge ourselves rightly, to see what our motives are. Um, and Paul in Corinthians, when he's talking to the Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So, self-examination is very important, especially we see that in this illustration. Paul, the Corinthians, they were um, selfishly lifting themselves up uh, above their brothers. The, the rich were taking the high positions and they were drinking and um, eating the good food and they were stepping on their brothers, basically. And so Paul, Paul is saying um, to check your motives, um, to have reverence for the covenant of the Lord. God gave his body and his blood for his church for his people. The blood, the cup, represents the covenant. We have reverence for the covenant and for his body. The Christians make up the body of Christ. And so we have to have our his heart for one another and for the church. Because uh, his heart is for his people, for his church. And he takes it very seriously. He's jealous for his people. And it's we see that by what Paul says here is a pretty serious deal. Um, examining ourselves to make sure that we're not sinning against one another. Um, and are we examining ourselves? Do we see sin and selfishness this seriously? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to search us and convict us? We can really only self-examine ourselves by the Holy Spirit. change only comes by the Spirit. You know. or ask the Lord, you know, like David, search me and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And my next next point from verses 26 through 28, I'm going to read it again. Then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days, saying, And the people said, Shall we go out once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? Or shall we cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. And I made my third point. God's agenda is faithfulness. He's bringing us to faithfulness. We see the people, Israel, broken and contrite. They're weeping. The whole army now goes up to Bethel. They, the whole army leaves the battle. They go up to Bethel weeping and fasting until evening and offering burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And I love this part. And verse 27 says, And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. So this is the third inquiry they go up and ask the Lord. 
but this time the narrator puts this parenthetical in the middle of the sentence. It says, For the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days, and Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days. Parenthesis, and he finishes his sentence saying, Shall we go out once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? So, the narrator is saying, I believe that now they have, they're broken and contrite. They have come full return to true worship. They have gone and they have gotten the Levitical priest. They have gotten the Ark of the Covenant. They have instituted the burnt offerings, the peace offerings. They've brought it all to Bethel. They've established true worship uh, according to the law, the right worship. And Phineas, uh, type of our true high priest, Christ. And the ark, type of God's covenant and his presence, the mercy seat, uh, the burnt offerings were for the atonement of personal sin so that the worshiper could enjoy fellowship with God, typifying Christ. So, um, and the peace offerings, they were optional sacrifices which could be brought in conjunction with a confession or a vow, or simply as a free will offering of gratitude. These added peace offerings help show Israel true repentance and desire for faithfulness. So we see them come back full swing to, or the Lord has brought them from faithlessness and disobedience to covenant to covenant worship, true covenant worship. Does the Lord, um, you know, God's agenda in our lives is faithfulness. Um, do we, it's bringing up whatever, like Jonathan said, whatever we're going through, whatever trial situation, you know, even in our faithlessness, God remains faithful. Yeah. Yeah. But he's at work in his faithfulness. He's doing something. He's trying to us to see, to self-examine our unfaithfulness. Why? What's the reason? And bring us to the true faith that produces faithfulness in our lives. True covenant obedience. And then the Lord says, go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Faithfulness to the covenant brings victory. And they overtake their enemies. Uh, Phineas our example of faithfulness here. And in Joshua 22, 13-16, it says, And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and the land of Gilead. And they said to them, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, Which, What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel, in turning away this day from following the Lord and building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord. This is one of the Transjordan tribes after the conquest and judges. They go back across and they build this altar so that Israel doesn't forget them or to exclude them from the place of worship. Well, they Israel takes it as they are building their own altar of worship, which would be covenant disobedience. Phineas is one of the first ones to go with the chief tribes of, or chief men of the tribes, to go and stop them. At the first sign of covenant disobedience, of false worship, Phineas is there. He's there to stop it. He's there to guard the true altar of God. He's there to guard the true faith and true worship. In Numbers 25 7, we see this Israelite, he brings a Midianite woman into the camp. And before the whole assembly, even Moses, and Phineas takes up a spear, and he goes, and he thrusts through the Israelite man and the woman together, and he stays the plague of God upon Israel. At the first sign of sin in the camp, of faithlessness and disobedience to the covenant, Phineas is there to thrust it through, to put an end to it where it starts. He doesn't allow it in the camp. And Number, and in verse 11 of Numbers 25, the Lord said to Moses, He 
he was jealous of my jealousy. So that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Phineas was jealous for the Lord. And God wants faithfulness in our hearts, a jealousy for his heart. He's jealous for us. He's trying to produce a jealous, wants jealousy in us for the things of God, for his covenant, for faithfulness to him, like the true faith that produces faithfulness. Um, to guard the altar, guard the true faith that we have been entrusted, and guard true worship. Um, does sin break our hearts and drive us to a greater dependence upon Christ? And are we zealous for the true faith, for the true altar, for true worship? Uh, tr uh, what was it? Once again, I look upon the cross. Once again, I'm broken inside. God is bringing the, us to the true faith. He's building faithfulness in our in our lives. Um, our problem is selfishness, self-dependence, um, self-judgment, uh, depending upon what we see is right. God is faithful in the midst of it all. Amen. But he's, he's using our trials, our struggles, he's using our defeats for our good. He's trying to Help us to self-examine, to see, to see, to look, and to examine if we be in the faith, um, in the true faith. We can be have a saving faith, but are we walking in it? Is it producing a life of faithfulness? Faithfulness comes from true faith, but true faith produces a life of faithfulness. And, you know, there's growth to this process. But the concept is still the same. No matter at what stage of growth you're in, there's still faithfulness that should be being produced. And there's still going to be trials and struggles and wars and defeats. And these things can be used for good. God is using these things to get us to examine and to come to the true altar, the true worship. Restore true worship. Again, bring us back to the cross, to the faith, Christ, the one who's slain for us, the forgiveness of our sins, so that the Holy Spirit can work in our lives and produce these things in us, produce faithfulness in us. And I know I didn't present this how I ought to have, but Sean's message today is I put this message together, and it's the same you know, heart of God. Like He's He's speaking to us. He is wanting faithfulness. Uh, I'm taking this word very seriously to myself. Um, he desires faithfulness. In us. His agenda is faithfulness. Whatever you're going through, that's the work that He is that He's doing.